Scrolling down, we now look at uh, enhanced entity relation or EER diagrams. Actually in some textbooks I've seen it as extended entity relations, but since El Masri textbook uses enhanced, we'll stay with that. Now the question is, what's the difference between ER and EER diagrams? Essentially, EER allows for both generalization and specialization. Where generalization, we can take several objects and maybe push them up to a higher level or more abstract form, such as graduate student, undergraduate student, becomes a notion of student. And specialization is basically, uh, you know, a refining type of process. Okay, and we have superclasses and subclasses in this particular context. Now let's take a look at the notation of what we use here for uh, EER types of diagrams. In this first case here, let me scroll up just to 10, there we go. We see the employee is the superclass, and we see the subclass is full-time and part-time. So typically the relation is with line here, and notice the, like the sideways or uh, the U's there as a way of showing that it goes from employee superclass to the subclasses. Now the circle here is used to convey uh, what information in terms of the relationship between the superclass and subclasses or superclasses and subclass. Typically there's one of three values here. The value D is short for disjoint, which means uh, instances in the employee class can be in at most one of the subclasses. So an employee is either full-time or part-time, but not in both at the same time. So it's mutually exclusive. Second representation, instead of disjoint, is we have an O for overlap. And in this case, a person could be in one or more subclasses. So here we have a person who is an employee and can also be a student. They might be just an employee, not a student, just a student, not an employee. Or they could be somebody who's working, also taking classes part-time. So this is a different way of showing the relationship between superclasses and subclasses. A third type we see here is union. In this case, the first two had one superclass going into multiple subclasses. Here we might have multiple superclasses going into one subclass. So for example, if in, in a housing example, if you buy a house and let's say you have to get a loan from the bank, well you as the person has some ownership in the house, the bank has some ownership in the house, and even your company, if they help you out, could be another uh, entity that participates here that has ownership in the house. So we have basically disjoint, overlap, and union. Okay, on the next page we see an example here in figure 212, and here we have student as a superclass going into two distinct subclasses, graduate and undergraduate. And one of the things I want to show is why would we have superclass and subclasses? Well, all students we would assume have a social security number and a major. However, we might want to identify certain features of a graduate student, and in this case we're showing that only graduate students might participate in seminars. Also, we see on the right here, undergraduate students may belong to fraternities or sororities, whatever the case may be. Now, <clears throat> one question is, well, wait a second. Can a student be a graduate student, undergraduate student at the same time? Well, that's a possibility. And if that were the case, we might have an O here for overlapping. How do you know which one to use? Well, you'd probably ask a domain expert, let's say someone, a dean at a university, if you were designing this for university, to help clarify that. So this shows how we go from superclass to subclasses. Any common attributes or relations get pushed up to the superclass up here. That's why we don't see graduate SSN down here and undergraduate SSN down here. Okay. Now another example, okay, this, this shows where we might have a motorized vehicle, it could be a car, a plane, or a train. 
Yeah, let's see, we've talked about this notion of disjoint in terms of specialization constraints. We also have in figure 216 the completeness constraint. Now in the example on the left, a student might be a graduate or undergraduate student, whereas the one on the example on the right, the student totally participates, but if we're going to have total participation, we have to consider all possible scenarios where a student could be graduate, undergraduate, or part-time. Now you could argue there might be other cases, but we'll assume these are the only three cases here for a student. So this means that every student must be in one of these particular categories. Okay. Okay, on this next page, we see an example where we have employee and all employees participate either as hourly salary or consultant. And what we see is a subtype discriminator. So we'd say employee status equals H for hourly, S for salaried, or C for consultant. Now you could easily um, you know, write particular values there, but it's another way of representing information. Okay, scrolling down, we can also represent multiple inheritance in an ER or EER type of diagram. So here we see student coming down here may be, let's say, a graduate or an undergraduate student, and the student may be in state or out of state. So if we want to talk about an international graduate student, they would fit in the category of graduate, obviously, and out of state. So <clears throat> we can represent multiple inheritance. Now, <clears throat> what exactly is a lattice? Well, we know what a, a tree is, for example, and for example, a binary tree might have, uh, you know, at most one parent and no more than two children. A lattice structure is actually an extension of a, let's say, a tree structure where any node might have two or more parents. So that's the way we distinguish a lattice from a, let's say, binary tree. So at this point, we've looked at the different features for ER and EER types of diagrams. We'll stop here on this video and go to the Texas Department of Public Safety video and see an actual example of how we might apply these different uh, features. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.